What is going on guys? Welcome back to another exciting episode. Today's video is gonna be kind of a piggyback off of the last video that I just posted, which I'll leave a link to it up here if you guys haven't seen it yet, but it's just a cast a catch of an eight pounder that I caught this last season. And I caught it on the bait that we were talking about today, and that is the Andrew Hinkle Hinkle Trout. So if you guys are ready, let's get right into today's video. So basically, I kind of just wanted to do a video on my favorite glide bait of all time, and I've never really done a standalone video on this bait. And <laughs> the standalone videos that I see of other YouTubers talking about this bait, they have a lot of misinformation, and they kind of just talk out of their ass, and they don't know the actual details of the bait. So today we're gonna be kind of talking about the history of the bait, how I like to fish it, the ins and outs of the baits, and just everything about what makes this bait so amazing. So let's first start off with the bait itself. It's an 11 inch bait, nine ounces. So it's a pretty large glide bait and it's made by a guy named Andrew Hinkle in Southern California. It has these awesome rubber fins to add realism all across the bait. As you guys can see, this one has been used and abused. It's got me a lot of good fish. And it's just a beautiful trout profile glide bait. So speaking of the history of the Hinkle Trout, the Hinkle Trout is, again, made by a guy named Andrew Hinkle, and he started making the production model of these baits back in like 2013. And before that, he was giving out some prototype baits prototype baits that went to guys like Mike Gilbert who caught his personal bus 17 pounder on a prototype Hinkle Trout. Another one of my buddies in SoCal, he caught his personal best on it as well, a 12 pounder. So the prototype stages of the bait were absolutely getting crushed by big fish in Southern California. And the most popular glide baits at the time was the Depths 250 because Butch Brown had kind of just released all of his footage and there was a lot of hype around the 250 at the time. But then this bait kind of came out and it shocked a lot of people because a bait of this size was able to swim as fluid as it did. For the first couple of years that Andrew was making these baits, he would paint them himself. And that lasted for about two years until he actually started just making the blanks and then he would send them out to a guy named Paul Smith of Piss Custom Baits and he would paint the baits and then you can buy them. Back then they were 175 and you had to still get on a waiting list and that still holds true today. It was tough, you had to wait a, a long time but once you were able to finally get your hands on one, you knew that the wait was well worth it and you got your hands on a super rare bait. So though they were going for 175 back then, they were reselling for 300, 400, 500 dollars. I mean my first Hinkle Trout that I bought in 2015 I got for a steal at 325. Like it was just insane prices, but I knew that I wanted the bait even back then. Like I knew like this bait was gonna change the way that I fished and it definitely did. This model bait that I have here, I got a long, long time ago. And I believe this is like a second or third generation Hinkle Trout. You can kind of tell by the paint scheme. You can tell like, okay, and you painted these these are the original red fins that would come on there as well. And so you kind of piece it together and you go back and like, oh, okay, this seems to be one of those ones that was made, you know, in the second or third batch ever made. And it's a really cool bait. It's definitely a little bit different than some of like the new ones that I've had in the past, but it absolutely gets crushed and it gets absolutely bit. So that's a brief history of the Hinkle Trout. Now let's get more in depth with the bait and what makes it so special. So this bait at 11 inches has a very fluid, long glide to it. Now at the time, like I said, the 250 was very, very popular. And the 250 has a great fluid cutting side to side action, but it's not extremely wide. You can kind of get it to glide pretty wide, but definitely not as wide as the Hinkle Trout. The other big bait that a lot of guys were fishing back then was the Mother. And the mother has that nice long wide glide, but it has more of like a roll, kind of a head down action to it. So this kind of bridged the gap for guys that wanted something that had a very fluid glide like a 250, but stayed really true and fluid in the water column. So this bait completely bridged the gap for that and it crushed it. And that's what makes this bait very, very special. At the time, there was no other bait this size that was able to perform like the Hinkle Trout. 
And another thing, at the time, there really wasn't any other glide baits that had the realism of the Hinkle Trout. I mean, it has these beautiful scales on it. The profile is incredible. The head detail is great. Like everything about this bait is very realistic when you look at a trout in the water. So at the time, there really wasn't a bait that was as detailed as a Hinkle Trout at the time. So it just pushed it even further why guys were like, oh, this bait is pretty crucial because of my waters where they eat trout a lot of the time. And this profile just looks just better than like a 250 or a mother or any other glide bait that was used at the time. And then, like I said, there was a waiting list and back then they were pretty hard to get. So while everybody was throwing like the depths 250, the guys, the couple of guys that did have the Hinkle Trout saw a lot of success throwing it because those fish were kind of getting more accustomed to seeing the same 250 go by and they would still bite it. Like, don't worry about that. But it seemed like when guys switched over to fishing the Hinkle Trout, they got more bites more followers and just better reactions overall after a certain amount of time. So, like I said, you had to get on, on a waiting list and it took a pretty long time, but once you were actually able to get your hands on the bait, you were pretty stoked because you knew like, all right, not a whole lot of guys have this bait. And so that kind of just helps me just a little bit to stand out and try and catch those really giant fish. The older models, like the one that I have here, kind of sinks like a rock. I mean, Andrew hadn't really perfected the slow sink. So basically on this one and some of the older ones that I've talked to buddies with, they had to drill out a lot of weight in this bait. But once you were able to lighten it up, you could get that bait to really fly out and stay there in the zone. Before it would fly out and then kind of start sinking right away. But with this one, when you lighten up the bait, you use smaller hooks, you drill out some weight, it'll shoot out and then kind of suspend there a little and then start to slowly sink. And to me, that's absolutely crucial. And I think that's why I get a lot of the bites that I do get on this bait. So kind of a pain in the ass because you have to take off the hinge and pull it out and then drill. And then if you mess up and take out too much weight, then you have to add weight. And it's like this whole thing. But with the newer ones that he makes now, he's weighted them completely different to where they come with like two odd or three odd ST41s, I believe, which if you put that on a new version blank, it's gonna be like a slow sink. So if you lighten up the hardware on, on the new ones, they'll be like a super slow float or a float. So it's cool that he's kind of adjusted. And there's other pros and cons to having a newer version than an older version. There's really not much physically different about the new ones versus the old ones. The only reason why I like buying the old ones is that the hinge here, right here, is shaved down just a little more on the newer ones. And the newer ones that I've found, they kind of cut more like a 250. At least the few that I have fished personally and I've gotten my hands on. I pretty much get rid of them right away because I'm like, well, I don't need a bait like this to fish like a 250. I'll just fish a 250 where it cuts kind of like this, where it's not it's not really wide. And it's just because the, the mold, I guess, and you kind of shave these down just a little bit more and it gives this bait just a little more play in the hinge. So with these other ones, you're able to actually shoot this bait out and it doesn't have that much joint play. It's a very, very small nuance that I have found, but that's why as if I see any of the older ones, no matter the price, I normally just kind of scoop them up because they're getting harder to find and the new ones just don't exactly satisfy my needs for this type of bait. Other than that, it's basically the same bait, same scale pattern, same head, uh, I believe even the same eyes, you might have switched the eyes, but the fins pretty much stay the same and everything else is just the same about this bait. Now, the bait isn't perfect by any means. It's a resin bait. So if you guys can look back here, this is definitely not a part of the original resin. So this is basically what happens when you hit a, a rock and you know, you kind of chip off a little bit of the tail. I've done it actually a handful of times where I have to super glue the tail back onto the bait. So you just do have to be 
fairly careful with the bait overall, but I mean, as you guys can see, I chip up the bait a lot. I mean, there's chips here all up and down the bait, but that's just a result of me fishing the bait in those tight spots where I'm lining a cast up right down a dock or right by a big boulder or a wall. And I'm trying to get my bait into that strike zone to get those bites. And sometimes you just sacrifice a few chips, a few broken tails and just different areas that break. I mean, I broke down here as well. That's not the original, like I've beat this bait up a lot, but I do it because I know it's going to get me bites and that's just the sole reason. So you have to kind of sacrifice the bait to get the bites, but I see that it's completely worth it because you can always just, you know, Frankenstein it back to life. Okay. Speaking about how I like to put my bait, let's talk about how I personally like to fish the bait. When I first got my Hinkle Trout back in 2015, I fished it fairly fast. Now the bait was not designed to be fished fast. This bait was meant to be fished slow with nice long wide glides. But going back to how it has that very fluid glide, I was actually able to pick up the speed quite a lot, quite a bit. And I was out fishing my buddy who would fish a 250, sometimes like three to two, four to two, four to one. Like this was getting so many reactions and this was all happening in the summertime. So I was fishing the bait really, really fast for a bait of this size, relatively speaking. And I was getting a lot of bites, a lot of action. And you might be thinking to yourself, like, why would you fish a trout profile bait in the middle of summer where the trout definitely aren't the key for it? Well, how I looked at it is this can look just like an 11 inch gizzard chat as well. I mean, it doesn't have a great gizzard chat profile, but if a fish is around those bigger gizzard chad, they're gonna look at this bait and be like, oh, okay, yeah, that's definitely just a gizzard chad that I've been eating lately. So in my mind, I was like, I can fish this year round as long as I'm fishing bodies of water that throughout the entire year, they're eating bigger prey items, whether it be gizzard chad, trout, bigger bluegill or anything like that, and the fish would commit and eat the bait. Again, bait was not designed to be fish fast. I got away with it being able to fish fast because of the bait that I had, the way that it swam and my cadence. And so there's definitely quite a few different ways you can fish it. You can fish it at a medium, you can fish it fast and how obviously you're supposed to fish it in that slow. So back then I was fishing the bait with much larger hooks. I was fishing anywhere from like size one aught quads down to size one quads to I believe like ST66s. I've been all over the place when it comes down to these hooks. And back then, my favorite hook to fish on the bait was either a one knot quad or a size one quad. And it seemed to stick fish extremely, extremely well. And I loved it. Nowadays, I've even downsized even more to these much smaller hooks and kind of taking a page out of Mike Gilbert's book of downsizing to upsize your bites. And basically, these are size two ST45 hooks. And they're really small in comparison to the entire grand scheme of the bait. And basically you might go like, well, how are you hooking any of those fish? And basically when you have a much larger grade fish and I have even hooked, you know, four and five pounders with this size hook, it just comes down to the placement where the fish are going to bite the bait. And for the most part, if you are, are around fish that eat, you know, gidget chat or trout, for the most part, they like coming up to the head and eating the head. And so when you have this bait and you have this small of a hook and you got the bait going through the water and a fish comes up, right? The bait's going to glide this way and the fish is here. My hand's the fish. It's going to come back and the fish is going to be on it. And then it's going to glide past the fish and the fish is going to see that this is the opportunity. It's going to come around and just headshot it. With these smaller hooks, what's nice is that when that fish comes up and just sucks because they're going to suck in the head, that means this smaller hook, since it's so light, is also going to suck up to the side here, right? And then you're going to hook the fish right in the corner of the mouth. So that fish that I just posted, if you guys see when I land it in the net, you'll see that the back half of the bait is sticking up and then the front half is still in the mouth and it was hooked perfectly in the corner of the lip of that eight pounder. So it works. It's just, you cannot fish your bait fast 
when you have hooks this small because what happens is when you're fishing this bait really, really fast and it's going and the fish is like, all right, I just gotta, I gotta hit this thing somewhere. I don't have time to headshot it because it's spazzing out. I'm just gonna hit it somewhere. And it happened to me this last season where I had a nine, 10 pound fish when it was super choppy and I was just working the bait a little too fast trying to blow through an area like an idiot. And I watched this fish come up, roll on it, miss it, come back around, full speed, just truck the bait. I went to swing, nothing there. And basically what that what happens is that when you don't have that suction to have that hook kind of suck into the mouth, they're just running into the bait and trying to just stun it, trying to kill it, and they're not going for an actual shot where you can get a really good hook in them. And these hooks are too small to ever try and clip the fish, like where it's like, oh, I barely hooked it. Like these hooks are too small for that. So when you work a bait too fast with these small hooks, you're gonna miss a lot of bites. But when you slow down and you get them to kind of come up and do that suck, where it's very natural for them to do on a bait of this size, you're gonna hook them, I'd say nine out of 10 times. There was a couple times where I was like, oh, well, I kind of missed like a decent fish. But like I said, I caught a five pounder that I watched come up and just do the same thing. I caught eight to nine pounders on these smaller hooks as well. So. Don't be afraid to downsize your hooks just because you think like, oh, I'm never gonna hook the fish. If you work the bait correctly, you're gonna hook the fish. And another thing that I kind of noticed with the Hinkle Trout in particular is this front hook hanger is slightly a bit more forward up here near the head than a traditional bait. So let's look at, we're gonna take a look at the room out. Oh. We're gonna take a look at the Roman made mother real quick. So the mother, the hook hanger comes back here and it's a fairly decent gap. They're semi-similar in size. I mean, about, about an inch longer, but as you see, there's this much gap here between the front hook hanger and the actual head of the bait. It's small, but you might be able to tell a difference that the Hinkle that front hook hanger is just slightly bit more forward. Just slightly, maybe like, maybe like one centimeter more forward. But it seemed like that one centimeter made a huge difference because I was talking to my buddy Jared and he was fishing the mother and he was like, dude, I'm getting these fish to come up and headshot the bait and I'm just not hooking them. And I'm thinking to myself like, that's weird. When I get my fish to headshot the bait, I hook them. I hook them every time. And so then I kind of took a closer look at the bait and said, oh, okay, like the hook is just that much more forward in front near the head. So when a big fish comes up and it headshots it, this hook is much closer and is able to actually get in the mouth where the mother just slightly, and this is with having some PE assist line. If you have just a normal split ring, just one little split ring, I mean, dude, there's not much give here. For that, for that hook to swing further up near the head. So this was just like a small revelation that I had where I was like, oh, okay, maybe that's very genius that Andrew Hinkle did. I don't know if he did it on purpose, but it was just something that I noticed where I was like, okay, I'm hooking a lot of these fish that come up and headshot it. And I think that is a sole reason where you use a smaller hook and that the hook hanger is just slightly bit forward and I just noticed that I got a lot of bites and hooking a lot of fish with these smaller hooks. And then a lot of guys are probably gonna ask what size snap that I use. I use this super small decoy egg snap. I mean, it's small in comparison to the bait. I believe it's a size three. It's the same size that I use for the canine. So I believe it's a size three. If I'm not mistaken, decoy egg snap, I've had no issues whatsoever on it. And it kind of goes back to, you know, downsizing to upsize your bite. So I believe like just going with this much smaller snap, smaller hooks, smaller split rings. And another thing, it lightens up the bait too. So, you know, if you can lighten it up as much as you can to get that very fluid glide, you're gonna, you're gonna get a lot more bites and have a lot more confidence in this bait. Now, the setup that I, was using this past season to fish the Hinkle Trout was this low down double extra heavy swim bait rod. It's a parabolic rod, it's an 8.3. 
So it's pretty long, it's parabolic, so on the cast, it loads a bit great so I can get nice, long, accurate casts with it. And then having it be parabolic, when you're fishing those lighter hooks, you want a rod that gives. If you're using a broomstick and you're using batten down drag and you're just trying to horse the fish in as fast as you can, you're probably gonna bend out some hooks because I mean, that's a light wire hook. Really, any size two hook is probably gonna just bend out just give or take, no matter what hook it is, right? So with that parabolic rod, it's gonna give, it's gonna load on the hook set on the fight. So you can kind of just nice and easy fight the fish in and still have control and just reel the fish in without bending out hooks. I know that's probably like a really big thing guys are thinking about when it comes down to using that smaller hardware. It's like, oh, I'm gonna bend out hooks. I'm gonna start losing giants. Like it doesn't happen. The only time that I, I bent out a hook this past season, was when it got stuck in the net and the fish was going crazy and it finally just bent out. Like, and that's it. Other than that, I was, I unfortunately had to bounce some big fish this season on those smaller hooks and it worked out just fine. No bending whatsoever. So having a nice parabolic rod is great in the long run when fighting the fish and as well as just casting. The reel I had on there was just at the, I had a couple of reels this past season on there. Right now, I just have this Daiwa Tatula 300, which is basically kind of the similar size that I was fishing. I had a Revo Big Shooter, um, the JDM, one of my favorite reels of all time. JDM Big Shooter, I tried out my Daiwa Z 2020 by Depths. That did just fine. So anything in that 300 size reel did just fine for me. And then I, I fished the Hinkle Trout on 20 pound fluorocarbon all the way up to 30 pound fluorocarbon. And then I'm kind of right now in the middle at 25 pound fluorocarbon where I feel like, all right, if I hook a fish and it gets me in a tree or on some cables or on a dock post or anything like that, the line is strong enough to where I can kind of keep pressure on it and not get sawed off right away. So, and luckily enough for me, I don't fish 15, 20, 25 foot visibility. Out here this last season, the cleanest it got was maybe eight. So. I'm not too worried about all that, but if you do go with the lighter line, it does help with the float sink rate as well. So if you go with lighter line, it's gonna keep that bait up. If you go with 30 pound fluorocarbon, it's gonna really sink that bait out. I'm kind of right in the middle, but that's just personal speaking because I fished a lot of nasty areas with the bait and I'm just like, I don't wanna get broke off with a giant. So that's that. Let's talk about the retrieve that I was doing for this past season. I told you guys kind of that in the beginning when I first got a Hinkle Trout, I was fishing it really, really fast and I had a lot of success with that. But slowing down to help with, obviously, like I said about the hooks, you know, getting bites. Basically my retrieve is a very slow like one and kind of just let it hang out there. One, one one, two, and let it just hang there. And a lot of my bites this last season was when I would do that one, two, one, two, and just let it hang, and then boom, you'd get that bite. And basically how I saw that in my mind was like, all right, so the bait's going, it's got the one, one, and then there's a fish on it, it's following it. And then it does that little speed up, that one, two, and that difference cadence, and it hangs there, is that's when that fish comes up and just hits it. And that's when it's on that pause and it hangs and the fish is like, all right, this is my chance. It's just hanging there. And boom, they'd bite it. So you kind of, I've played around with different retrieves. Like I've said in the past, I fished it fast. This past season, I fished it slow. And the bait just absolutely excels at being fished slow. And I found that out this last season where I was like, man, they really like this thing a lot slower than what a lot of guys are or normal or used to fishing a glide bait. So I actually had a conversation with Mike Gilbert about the Hinkle Trout. I will play some of that audio right now for you guys. Your first Hinkle Trout that you got um, was a prototype, correct? It had a completely different hinge on it? The first Hinkle Trout that I received was a nine inch bait, I think 9.25 inch size Hinkle Trout um, that had the screw eye joint on it and there was weighting issues with that one uh, sank a little bit faster was less stable and I expressed that to Andrew and he's like 
I got a bigger one. I'll swap it out with you. So then he gave me the size that is currently available today, which I'm not sure if it's exactly 11 inches, but I was called at the, at the 11 inch, mm-hmm. um, where, yeah, it was, uh, it had rubber bands glued to the inside of the joint and screw eyes as the actual joint. It had good old fashioned, like brown rubber bands, just super glued in. <laughs> but it swam pretty good, right? Oh, it swam, it swam great. Uh, I obviously took the, the hooks that Hinkle provided off of it and put size ones on it. So I lightened it up a little bit and then I drilled a hole down the mouth of it and put, what size weight is that little tiny guy? I should have them right here. I think it would be, what is, do they do a three thirty second ounce? Yeah, they weight? do. Like it's a little tiny one. Yeah. The really small yeah. one, right? Yeah. Put that in the nose just so it, it kicked the nose down just a little bit. So when I started to retrieve, it would go subsurface because when I was throwing it out there in the winter time, it was the water's cold enough and that bait was pretty much almost like a floater. Yeah. Yep. So just that little weight in the nose would pull it down just a little bit and then it balanced out the swim and it swam impeccably at a super slow pace. Yeah. It yeah. wasn't it wasn't a burn bait. Like and they still, in my opinion, still aren't. Like you don't fish them fast. No. No. But I mean, you and I would both agree that downsizing the hooks and lightening up the baits will get you an even more fluid, solid glide on it, correct? In as a general principle, not just applying it to the hinkle, but yes, light, making the bait a little bit lighter allows it to flow and flow through the water better, in my opinion. Yep. Everybody's different, but I noticed the same thing with like the 250s. Mm-hmm. You know, same thing. Hinkle, that's how I like to fish it, but other people can have success however they want to, but I've always fished it very high in the water column. Got it. Yep. Let them come up and eat it. Yeah. Yeah. And you would say that the Hinkle in some aspects are just very different to like a 250 where it's a lot wider of a glide and it might draw more attention to it. I believe you've talked about it where you started off with the 250, you got a lot of bites on it, but started to notice that they kind of started to wisen up to the glide of a 250 and then you switch to a Hinkle trout because of the difference in its in its glide correct uh partially the, the 250s i could er- get my hands on early none of them were like trout patterns mm. and i had success on those and then i was trying to do my own doctoring of trout patterns and it just wasn't really working out they kind of looked like clown trout <laughs> uh, but i definitely like the overall profile of the hinkle mm-hmm. when it was offered to me versus the 250 because it had a taller profile it had better flash in the water like it just in the water it looks really natural yeah yeah especially when they're dumping like massive amounts of trout in the water it's like Dude, I want to get as close as I can to the real thing as possible. Yeah, that's not taken away from the 250. The 250 was uh, still a great bait. It's, I mean, it's a good bait. Right. Yeah. You know? Right. It's just something like, different. It's, it's, it's a, it was a more stable bait. I'll say that the 250 was a far more stable bait. Mm-hmm. Like you could rip it and work it and that a lot more than I could with the hinkles. Even though I did do that occasion with the hinkle, it's, the hinkle is far less stable. It had one thing in my opinion that it did really well and that was slow roll keep it stealthy and those fish are gonna bite it yep yep that's what i've that's what i've learned out this uh this past season fishing mine was slowing down and it seemed like i got a lot more bites just slowing the bait down yeah like slower slower trying to think how i could put it like if somebody hasn't slow rolled a hud on the bottom Mm -hmm. they won't understand the concept but painstakingly slow but keeping the bait moving just slow enough so that you feel that pull against Mm -hmm. and then and then you feel that release of pressure as the bait turns yep if you're just slow enough so you're doing that but if you go any slower then it's just not going to do anything. Yeah. Like yeah. you want to be r- right at the speed where it starts to actually have action. Like that seems to work to me. That's where it performed the best. Like it's really slow for a hard bait. 
Oh yeah. I mean, when I was fishing mine, I noticed that a lot of my my bites would come off like a slow like one. 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 You talking about two. That's your crank speed? Yeah, like Revolution. yeah. And then like I would do like a Hold one on, I'm imagining it real quick. Let me so like <laughs> So like a glide and then let one. it hang out there and then glide. One. Let it hang out there. Glide glide and then after that one two and i let it hang it would just hang there for like a second or even two seconds and that's when i got the bite yeah i, I never I, I don't recall getting them on the pauses but so yeah my revolution for crank is probably like thousand one thousand two like it's probably that like it's that so it's, it's very similar to what you just described okay like it's slow yeah, it's it's, it's much lower than what guys are normal to or used to fishing a glide bait. Yeah, but you can't pull that off if the bait's weighted heavy. Right. Yeah, I was saying how the one that I have, I had to drill out a lot of weight just to be able to get to do that. And I was telling them like, Andrew, and kind of the original ones, like you were saying, you had to drill out a lot of weight. It seems like the new ones, he's got them weighted a lot differently. Like they're a lot lighter. Like as soon as you put in lighter hooks on the new blank ones apparently they're like perfect yeah and the, well the, that's because not everybody like andrew and i have discussed it in the past is like what performs well for me and what i like is probably outside of the realm of the, the common angler mm -hmm. meaning like what on average people are going to want so yeah. you want to you want to find that middle of the road versus hey bro i got the bait and it's floating <laughs> like you know, so where I, I didn't mind that because it's easier to, for me to add a little bit of weight to a hard bait yep. than it is to take it out. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, then you're, then you're in there, like, taking apart the joint, yep. pulling out the head, <laughs> like, Then you go, oh, dude, I drew up too much. And, <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and they baits are a couple hundred bucks. Yep. So it's, yeah. you know, it's scary. Oh, yeah. But, yeah, I mean, dude, yeah, that's not saying there's anything wrong with the the new hinkles at all with the, that new joint that was great as far as durability mm -hmm. because i i wore out like andrew had to replace the hinges because i would wear them out oh god <laughs> that, and that's why he switched to that joint is because the bait i had i loved it but you gotta think about the common person going dude is this acceptable for them to be like like I was bending either the screw eyes or they were just like wearing out. So the bait was like, Oh, I guess it's done. And this, there's nothing for the screw eye to bite into anymore. It's just worn out. Yep. Yep. So that's, that's not necessarily acceptable in the eyes of most angles. Me, I would just say that's the cost of doing business. Dude, yeah. Bait, it, it, <laughs> I don't care. I'm yeah. <laughs> I, I totally get the perspective though of like, Hey man, like the other thing works like 99.9%. .9 it's just that little tiny fraction of a difference. Like, I want the thing that's going to last longer. So I think Andrew right. made, that's the right, that, that was the right choice. Overall, you know, yeah, for, for sure. Yeah. All right, well, thanks for the insight, man. Appreciate it. If you guys have not subscribed already to the Working Glass Zero channel, I will leave a link down to it in the description below, and hopefully Mike has some exciting new projects on the way. All right, awesome. <laughs> thanks. All right, thanks, thanks for the, for the time, man. I'll talk to you later. Yep. yep. So yeah, it was great always talking to Mike. I mean, Mike, he, his 17 came on a, that prototype Hinkle shot. Just an awesome story. If you guys haven't seen that video, I'll leave a link to it up here. It's one of the dopest videos ever. It's just so cool. It's very inspiring. It makes you want to go out there and go catch a giant bass. But yeah, that is the Hinkle trout. One, I mean, it's my favorite swim bait of all time. I've caught a lot of good fish on it. It's been a really, really good bait to me throughout all of the years that I've had them and fished them. So, all right, guys, if you have any other questions that I kind of didn't answer about the bait, leave them down below. I will try and get back to them. If you guys have had experiences with the Hinkle Trout, let me know your guys' experience and if you like the bait or not. Other than that, thank you guys ever so much for watching, and as always, go out there and chase your dreams.